Hello and welcome to The Briefing Room. I'm Bill Freilich, your host from WTCM Radio News. It's our weekly roundup of some of the stories that are making headlines across northern Michigan. And joining me at the table this week, Linda Steffen from Interlochen Public Radio. Linda, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. And then Jakob Wheeler from the Glen Arbor Sun. Jakob, thank you for coming in. Thank you, Bill. It's good to have you guys with us. And we wanted to start uh, with you, Linda, one of the stories uh, from IPR last week uh, about Munson Medical Center and uh, some new was it survey results. Is that the best way to, to, to put a finger on it? I think it was an analysis from Consumer Reports. It came out in the September issue. Okay. And it showed that Munson ranked very poorly in safety specifically with surgeries. You know, we uh, have talked for years because we get the press release every year about, you know, Munson is in the top 100. Uh, I don't think that happened this year, but um, tell us, I guess, what, how you noticed this, first of all, and, and, and what kind of response you got from Munson. Well, you know, I just, I, it was just a tip from a, a friend who reads Consumer Reports who was surprised to get the information and called me up and told me. And I thought Munson was pretty thoughtful about it. They were surprised about the rankings, but they said they were willing to take a look at it. They weren't really sure where the, the numbers were coming from and the specific methodology in the report, um, but they were willing to, to have a look and to see what's going on in, in terms of surgery at the hospital. What was involved in that um, Consumer Reports story or the, those rankings? What do you, you know, recall about what, what the gist of the, the whole study was in the first place? Well, the study was looking specifically again at surgery, and that's the first time that they've looked at that. And they were looking at Medicaid, or excuse me, Medicare patients and they're looking at things like length of hospital stay and uh, the number of people who died during or following a surgery while they were in the hospital. And the length of stay is sort of a corollary that typically across hospitals, the longer that someone has to stay, that means the more complications that they had, that sort of thing. Right. So it's, very, it's pretty paltry amount of information. And even the researchers with Consumer Reports acknowledge that. And I'm not saying that that doesn't mean that this is valuable information. But I think sometimes we look at a headline and we get caught up in the headline. And the real point in healthcare, in my opinion, is that we really don't have a lot of transparency. We don't have a lot of information. There's not a lot of publicly available data out there for consumers to, to know what's going on. And, and that was a point with the researchers in this report as well. The other question I wanted to ask you about that was what kind of response did you get from, from Munson, I guess just in terms of A, their willingness to call you back quickly, uh, what, you know, this is obviously not something that they dispersed uh, freely on their own. So what, what was right. just the reaction? They actually did call me back quickly and, and got me an interview pretty fast. Very good. Uh, Jakob, I want to turn over to you and let's talk about one of the uh, stories you've been working on. Uh, economic investment has been a, a topic in Leelanau County. The county commissioners uh, made a decision to uh, I don't know, disband their relationship with the Economic Development Corporation and there's more follow-up there. Correct, yeah, that was earlier in the summer they disbanded the, the EDC. They felt as though the, the money they were spending wasn't getting them much. Um, been hearing kind of an outcry among citizens and, and also in media, local and downstate media, that uh, you know, they feel that, that was perhaps a poor decision and, and, and the, the, uh, the Leland County Board of Commissioners may have uh, embarrassed themselves a bit. Um, we've been doing a series in the Glen Arbor Sun, I as editor have been soliciting a series of stories from a few of my writers about um, you know what economic development means in a place like Leelanau County. What it can, um, what what the payoffs can be, and some examples of where economic development has yielded results, namely some small businesses that have gotten some help from the county or elsewhere, or you know businesses that have made kind of far-reaching investments themselves and that have paid off. They've reached a level of sustainability. Uh, Bob Azuzu, a clothing company in Lake Leelanau, is a perfect example. We did a feature on that a little earlier. Um, the Empire Asparagus Festival actually was in a situation uh, in May where, uh, because of a frost, they were out of asparagus in Empire, uh, mm -hmm. I think five, six days before the festival. But because of relations with um, Cherry Capital Foods uh, and kind of creative collaborations and, and other economic developments, they had uh, investments they had made in the past, they were able to get asparagus from down in Oceana County and elsewhere in Michigan and save the day. Um, so uh, looking at ways in which, in which economic development can pay off. What do you make of that whole, uh, uh, the decision by the county and 
I guess I, I'm trying to decipher whether it was a, a decision to disband the EDC and we just don't want to be a part of this anymore, or if there was some more maybe thoughtful background of, of how much value are we getting for this? Are there other ways to do it? Because the, the buzz seems to be, we just don't care about economic growth in Lelamont County. And there I, were a few quotes attributed to yeah, the commissioners. Yeah, so. I mean, the Record Eagle did a great job of, of kind of uh, reporting the minutes from these their, their meetings. I think it's a bit of ide ideology, certainly. Um, you know, some you know, small government, uh, we're, we don't need investments that aren't absolutely necessary. I think there's probably also some personalities involved, uh, you know, some butting of heads within meetings between the EDC and the, and the commissioners. Obviously, we now know that one of the commissioner's husbands went after, I think it was Glenn Pugh of the Record Eagle, um, storming into their office and, and wanting to pick a fight. Um, so there are some personalities involved, mm -hmm. but, but I think there are some ideologies involved. And I think the idea, I mean, you'll have personality clashes in small communities, right? Those are inevitable, but the ideologies are more interesting, I think. The uh, economic investment and the economic opportunities, Linda, are something that's kind of on the on the forefront of the potential discussion uh, up in Alpena uh, recently too because they are excited about this economic possibility for what we like to call drones, unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, tell us about the, the developments there in Alpena and, and what they're trying to do. Well, maybe you, you know as much or more as I do, to be honest, but it is interesting, you know, in, to my mind when I look at, at that project, you know, I think we're still not allowing drones flying commercially in the airspace. That's that's rather surprising. They're taking it slow on that. We're, there's a lot of privacy issues involved in that mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But a whole lot of industries are very, very interested, just chopping at the bit to to have that happen. And and at NMC, which is uh, a group of people involved in in NMC and, and the drone project, are also involved in this program in Alpena. They're, they're all really eager to be helping with real estate and examining pipelines and, and doing a whole lot of commercial interest with, so, with drones. So it's interesting that it's not being done nationwide and that potentially we could be one of the test sites. And if you're a person who's concerned about privacy, that's, a, that's yeah. an interesting thing from that angle as well. And, and I'm just trying to kind of go back in my mind from this kind of came out, well, it's, it's been in discussions for a while. I know they had a meeting recently here up in Alpena, but one of, uh, they're trying to find six federal test sites, is that right? And Alpena wants to be one of them? Right, and the first of their kind, and it's a statewide consortium of people basing themselves in Alpena. They think they've got a good chance at being one of the sites just because there's an opportunity to fly over the Great Lakes. There's the rural landscape and also the collaboration of the statewide site that they think that maybe they have a leg up over the competition. What, what do you make of the, I don't know, maybe the public perception or uh, just the concept of, of drones? If, when, when you first hear something like that, Jakob, what runs yeah, through we your were, mind? Yeah, we were talking about that a little early before the show started. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I feel like when you hear the word drone, you immediately go to, many of us, we immediately associate with um, with the vehicles, the weapons, really, you know, flying over the tribal regions of Pakistan, and they're used, um, you know, many would say defense, but they're used, you know, to kill. Um, and yet, what's probably less known by most Americans is that drones, um, you know, have have developed uses far beyond uh, warfare, um, surveillance certainly, but you know, monitoring for crop damage. Um, they they can and will be used in you know rescue missions if someone goes goes off their kayak between yeah. North Manitou and the mainland. Um, so it's a complex issue for certain, but I mean there there are, there are plenty of uses for them beyond just um, beyond just the defense department. And there are a whole lot of people who developed a hobby around it, even that they can't fly them yet. That's really fascinating. I met somebody in Traverse City maybe a year ago or last winter who was showing me all of his pictures of his of his drone and he can't fly it but but he's mm -hmm. ready mm -hmm. uh, and the the existence of the, the program at NMC may also be a benefit um, as well to Alpena being chosen right right that they're already there's already unmanned flight happening in the area and the expertise is here that's nice well we have that possibility on the horizon uh, and Jakob will turn back over to you um, in, in addition to uh, as you said the 
search for someone uh, off of Manitou Island. Uh, more recreational news out of, uh, of Lelanau County with Sleeping Bear Dunes, uh, another busy summer. Uh, for them, you guys have been following the, the trail of visitors that roll through the park. Looks like it'll be the second busiest summer ever for Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore and for the Glen Arbor and Leelanau County area. Uh, July, we have the July figures, it was the second busiest July ever after last year. The big question in my mind was, did this have a chance of making a run at, um, at 2012, which was of course what I've been calling the, the summer on steroids because of yeah. it was the summer immediately following the Good Morning America honor, which really cast a national spotlight on the region. It's not gonna eclipse that um, annually, nor did it in July. Uh, we'll see about August. I suppose it could give 2012 a run for it, but it's the second busiest summer ever. So, you know, uh, businesses are certainly raking it in still. It was good to, s to hear that because I was also of the mindset that, you know, 2012, maybe this was just the bubble and it burst and then we're going to go back to 1990s numbers now that everybody's been to Sleeping Bear. But it's good to see that they're still pretty, pretty darn busy. Yeah, I mean, it was a, a bit of a, a, a very small slide from July 2012 to July 2013, but it wasn't that drastic of a fall off. It's interesting you mentioned the 90s. Um, the third... Um, well, what looks as though it'll be the third uh, heaviest year in terms of visitation was actually 1999. 99 was the previous high before 2012, before the okay. Good Morning America induced summer on steroids. Um, so we actually, and I, I, I think some businesses in Glen Arbor, some who are concerned about too much growth too quickly, often forget that you know in 99 during the kind of booming economic years before before the recession and all this, um, that actually was the previous high. And then there was a bit of a, an ebb after that. Um, so yeah. we may see something in cycles. You've also got uh, a contributor to the Glen Arbor Sun that's been working on a series of, of stories. And maybe you can tell us how you connected with this person, the stocking stories, uh, someone related to the, mm -hmm. the, the namesake, the Pure Stocking Drive. We've been thrilled to have uh, to run stories all summer from Kathleen Stocking, who's a longtime area writer. She wrote a great book, um, a claim book called <coughs> um, Letters from the Lilina back in, I think, the 80s. She was in the Peace Corps in Romania, just returned. Um, she's the daughter of Pure Stocking, who was the largest well, he owned the most land in Leelanau County before the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore was formed, and they got a lot of, a lot of basically what was his land. Um, so she, she's able to, to, to really offer perspective that's so valuable to us. I mean, she understands what our area was like in the 60s and 70s and 80s and what yeah. it was like before the park. Um, she's a beautiful writer. She does a lot of historical pieces and, and casts them in kind of a, a, a current light. Uh, we had a story in our most recent August 8th edition about African-American pioneers who actually lived around the Glen Lakes um, in the 1870s, so long before the National Park was there. But in fact, you know, Glen Arbor and Empire, these towns were actually more diverse then than they are now, which uh, is funny to think about. That was a great story. Mm -hmm. Linda, let me turn back over to you. We talk of, uh, of history, and, and I know one of the, the stories that came out this week for Interlocking Public Radio, the efforts for native languages uh, and to do a little broader education uh, of that. Tell us uh, what, what made the, the headlines there for IPR this week. Well, we just, I don't know if it made headlines, but we, we sent a reporter out to the language and culture camp, which is something that many of the Northern Michigan tribes do a lot. And, and of course, I, it was interesting, there are just two members of the Grand Traverse Band, Vatawan Chippewa Indians at this point, that speak the language fluently. Yeah. Um, so just that the whole history of American Indian boarding schools and removing the language over a period of time, just take, re taking that out of the local tribes and they're trying to revive that really first language of the Great Lakes region. Mm -hmm. And so it was it was just we just had this charming, charming opportunity to hear from some very tender voices about why reviving this language is important to them and what the meaning behind the words are and, and how that links into understanding an ancient culture that that's so important. So I I thought it was just such a tender piece. It's available at our website if anybody wants to listen. It's just a basically a soundscape from that event. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Our They're, reporter Laura Herberg did that. It was re really lovely. They just released their uh, their 
was it a twice a year list of 2% um, uh, f funding from their gaming revenue. And one thing that I noticed about the list this year, and I'm sure it's happened before, but um, I, it, it made me think of that was there are tens and tens of thousands of dollars going to schools all over the five county area specifically for cultural study of, of Native American uh, uh, language, or I don't know if language, but culture. Uh, so it just, it, I guess maybe that ties in with the effort to, to keep it alive and to keep the yeah, and I think we're really coming. starting to see the tribes reach out to the broader community as well and to, to want to be involved and not just teach themselves, but to, to, to teach the rest of the community about what, what was here before, too. We think, uh, uh, we, I say we, but a, a lot of us maybe think of uh, Peshabi Town as that's the, the Native American center, um, and naturally it is, but what do you see down in Interlock and Benzie um, Glen Arbor, I mean, how, does the culture kind of transcend all across the region or, or do we just, do we have tunnel vision at this point? Any thoughts on, on how it blends Specifically together? Specifically about culture or you mean the tribe's influence and impact? Yeah, yeah um, the tribe's influence. Uh, well, you know, you, do, you see, for example, in Benzie County, there's a tribal outpost um, and they provide a community center, the alternative program for Benzie County Central is run through the offices of the Grand Traverse Band okay. in, in Benzonia. So that's just an example of how they, how they reach out and are involved in the community. And, and I think you see that kind of thing all over. In terms of the, the culture of the tribe, I know that there have been a number of programs at NMC over the years where they're trying to get more information in. But I, I can only speak from my own experience, which is that when I was in early elementary school in, in the early 80s, the tribe, Grand Traverse Band, was establishing a brand new government and there was a constitutional convention essentially happening in Leelanau County. And as a child in, in Traverse City, I, I knew nothing of it. So I hope we're learning and I hope we're moving toward and making strides to, to realize the significance of the cultures. But. Yeah. Jakob, let me turn back over to you. And uh, one of the, the last stories on our list uh, from, from your neck of the woods is uh, environmental issues, uh, and oil issues. You've got uh, uh, protests that you uh, had covered up uh, at the tip of the mitt on uh, Mackinac Bridge. Tell us about uh, where you go from here in, in terms of what, what we can pick up on in the Glen Arbor Sun. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, we, we ran a story um, in, in July about Essentially, about you know examining uh, the use of of of, of, of well, piping uh, tar sands, heavy bitumen crude uh, through pipelines across the country. Um, we ran it on the three-year anniversary of the Kalamazoo River spill um, from 2010, which of course was the largest on-land oil spill in U.S. history. Um, and the story talked a bit about um, you know environmentalist concern about one day were tar sands oil to be pumped through the Straits of Mackinac. Um, there's a pipeline just above the floor bed under the Mackinac Bridge, which of course is direct access to Lake Mich Lakes Michigan and Huron. The story really was about, and some of our coverage has been about, I mean, um, tar sands is, is very different from uh, typical petroleum. Uh, tar sands is, um, depending on who you talk to, the consistency of peanut butter or honey when it's extracted from the ground, it needs chemicals to be added to it to make it viscous to be able to be pumped. Uh, in the case of Kalamazoo, that chemical was benzene, and, and once the, there was a spill and it reaches uh, oxygen, the oil then sinks and the benzene goes into the air and hurts local residents, makes them sick. Um, so, you know, it's an informative story telling people um, that this is, I mean, we have entered a, a, a new frontier in terms of the kind of natural gases and oils and, and fuels we're using, and um, it's not like it was yesterday. It's not Jed Clampett's bubbling crude from the Beverly Hillbillies. Um, we will be uh, running a story in the Sun as well about um, about hydrofracking. Um, fracking, you know, is obviously a contentious issue in Michigan. There's a ballot initiative to stop it. The Michigan Chamber um, is behind it. Obviously, there's a lot of economic payoff to this new technology to get at these new fossil fuels. Right. Um, not so much in Leelanau County, but in Benzie County nearby, um, you know, there have been, um, you know, allegedly a whole bunch of uh, environmental calamities um, as a result of fracking. So we'll be looking into those. And Linda, on, the, on a similar note, let's take our, our closing minute here and just 
tell us briefly about the, the brine story, uh, and that's in Benzie County as well, another environmental concern. And that's, I suppose, related to, to fracking as well, but the, the extracting from oil and gas wells, there's a byproduct that's a brine. It's basically a salty mixture, and it's really common on dirt roads across northern Michigan that county, commissioner, county road commission, commissions will pay to have the oil industry spray that brine to keep dust down on the roads. And, and, um, and something went wrong in Benzie County recently in this summer, and that brine w was not just a salty mixture, but it, it, people who smelled it th and went to, to look at it, they smelled the distinct odor of chemicals and um, even had headaches later on in the day. And it was found just, there happened to be a random sample taken of that particular truck, and so they were able to, to research it back and find out that that was a tainted batch that was sprayed on the roadways. And um, so it's, it's, Bob Allen, our reporter, did just a fantastic job looking into that story and giving all the details. The DEQ says, hey, this is generally pretty well regulated. It was just a little slip up. And a former regulator that, that he talked to said, I don't believe that at all. I think we allow the oil and gas industry to self-regulate way too much. And, mm -hmm and that it's a recipe for disaster. And, and his point, which was kind of interesting, which was that if, if it really did stink that badly, how come the drivers didn't even notice? Do we know what chemicals might have been uh, released as part of? Benzene, Benzene. is one of them, which yeah. is a known carcinogen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yep, they tested for a number of chemicals. They were much higher than, than human standards for human contact. But then, of course, there's so many more chemicals that are not tested for that are part of, of crude oil. Causing lots of concern, to say the least. It yeah. could be. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the accountability to it, you know, following a story like that, uh, I, I think it really behooves we, us as journalists to, to follow the story of the accountability, really. I mean, was the DEQ monitoring this? Um, did the oil and gas companies have free reign? And, uh, and, and, and what happens after someone is either intentionally or erroneously found to be dumping benzene on Benzie County roads? Well, guys, I want to thank you both for coming in. Uh, Linda, why don't you tell us uh, not only on the radio, 91.5, right, but tell us where we can find you online. IPRnews.org. Okay. And Jakob, Glen Arbor Sun? GlenArborSun.com. Great. Guys, I want to thank you both for coming in, and thank you for tuning in this week to The Briefing Room. I'm Bill Freilich, and we'll see you again next time right here.